privilege to be here this morning. We uh, thank you, Pastor and Ed, and Ed Weyenmeyer. Ed has been trying to get us here for, I think, two or three years. Schedule never worked out. Thank you, Ed, for not giving up. I really appreciate that. You have the gift of perseverance. Thank you. And we want to thank all of you for the ways that you are serving our Lord here on the island and all around the world. We've been told about the 36 different ministries that you're supporting, and 30% of your budget goes to missions that is so unusual and so commendable. Thank you for your um, fellowship, your partnership with all of us who are um, getting the gospel to people who need to hear it. We really appreciate it. This morning, we'd like to talk to you about the transformation that happens when people have the opportunity to hear and read God's Word in their own language for the very first time. Um, but first, Bob, would you like to pray for us, and then I'm going to read some scripture. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. We read this morning's scripture already in, uh, in my language, and I assume yours. I'd like to read it to you in our the power to open a thing that allows to play now. I want that in near one now. Next slide, please. If you didn't know. E myself po ni prum cantata now. O e natico sono. E mas au. Mas au nai au min pene pigian tentacan. Cot in ni prum e no. I te sien. Cot sono. A wamre er pigian. I te ni prum e no. Ko win me set go, ko mon bien pani ani. Elite yi tuk mon ek na tuk win im ani. Re mo e ye so na e, tuk e set na ya in, ya tuk om e moil ne. Ya tuk wanan lo e ye paneti in nan re, ar wanan re lo so ne. Re o rit o tuk win o mon o mon bien. And if that was unusual to you and strange to you, now you know what it's like. To be in church, to have a church, and to hear God's Word being read in a language you don't understand. This, too, is the Word of the Lord. In 1987, Don and I and our 11-month-old daughter and way too many suitcases uh, traveled from the west coast of Florida to the north coast of Papua New Guinea. It's an island nation in the South Pacific about 9,000 miles from here, just north of Australia. Our village was built on a narrow strip of sand between Sisano Lagoon and the Pacific Ocean, three miles long and just 100 yards wide. And if you watched football yesterday, 100 yards is a pretty important number. Our son Eric came along a couple of years later. We loved our life on the beach in Arab. I homeschooled Eric and Brianna, and John played with them just about every afternoon at 5 o'clock on the beach after his day of work. But you know how grandmas are. And uh, Brianna and her husband Curtis are living, you can change the slide now, are living in Macon, Georgia. They just moved there in June. Our son, uh, grandson Elias and his baby brother Marcus. And Curtis will be installed today as the pastor of uh, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church in Macon. And our daughter Brianna is a marriage and family therapist. Um, hoping to work with missionary kids someday and missionary families. Uh, next picture, our son Eric and his wife have moved to the Atlanta area. Um, our daughter, granddaughter Anna, and her new baby brother, uh, Shepard. Eric owns his own business taking real estate photography, and those pictures, all the post processing is done by women in the Philippines who've been rescued from slavery. So we are. Um, Proud of our kids, obviously, and happy to have them on this side of the country. They, they both moved from the west coast of the U.S., but both of them would say they wouldn't trade growing up in Papua New Guinea for anything. Many more pictures are available for any other day. 
But we didn't go there to our village, of course, just to hang out on the beach. Papua New Guinea has about 7 million people who live in a land area about the size of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama combined. God led us to Papua New Guinea, to Arup village, so that the people who speak the Arup language could have the same privilege that you and Bonnie and I have. And that is to hear God speaking to us clearly in a translation of His Word that we can understand so that He can transform our lives through His Word. So the first few years, our job was to learn the language, learn about their um, culture and their customs there, learn to speak the language, and, uh, of course, become part of the community. And before I thought I was ready, some local church leaders came to me and said, time to start translating, John. I didn't think I was ready, but I lost the argument, and we started translating, and we started on um, the uh, Mark's Gospel. And for the next few years, they were um, teaching me about Arab language and culture, and I was teaching them about the Bible and about Bible translation. And together, we were making some pretty good progress and really enjoying working together. Then in 1998, just 11 years after our arrival in Papua New Guinea, everything about our life and our village, our village changed abruptly in one night. A very localized tsunami sent three large waves across that little strip of sand and destroyed everything in our village. Every person, every house, everything was swept into the sea. Over 2,000 people were killed that, light, that, that night. A third of the Arab uh, population. Could we have the next slide, please? Most of those who died that night died without ever hearing a word of scripture in their own language. But God was there and already had in mind what He was going to do. And we don't have time to tell you that whole story. It's in the book that Conrad mentioned. There's a short film at wickless.org that you could find. Just put our names in, you'll find it. That tells you all the amazing things that God did to turn our work in one language on the north coast of Papua New Guinea into a translation project that now serves many languages in the surrounding area. Three years after the tsunami, three years after the tsunami, over 20 translators from 11 languages now met for the first time to begin, to begin translating into their own languages. And for me, the most exciting part was watching Pastor Peter Monopiki and Amy Lee Corday, two translators that I've been training, training, teaching, advising all of these new translators from these other languages. And then we watched the translation project become a discipleship program as these translators learned, learned the Bible, about the Bible together, learned each other's worship songs, prayed for each other, and encouraged each other in their faith. And we even saw them plant another church because of their collaboration with each other. Each morning, when they're together for translation, they do an inductive Bible study on the passage that they're currently translating. I love hearing them talk about how God's Word is challenging them and also how it's confronting their culture. During those translation workshops, the translators work together on the same scripture at the same place at the same time. And what they're finding is that as they discuss together the difficult things that they have to figure out how to say in their languages, it's a great way to learn what those things mean. For example, let me just do a quick survey here. Raise your hand if you've ever been skin windy. Okay, how many of you never raised your hand just as a matter of principle? Okay, that's what I, that's what I thought. Well, all of you have been skin windy from time to time, and you'll soon, soon learn what it means. In the Luke chapter 8 story about that woman who had been sick for a very long time, remember that story? Eventually, Jesus says to her at the end of that story, And talk to me, believe ye enough, O Ekelomon, enough will live with him. My daughter, your faith has healed you. You go skin with me. Well, I'm checking this translation for accuracy, among other things. And so I said to Emil and Peter, What's this skin windy thing? And they said, Emil says, Emil's really good at explaining things. He says, Here's the picture, John. You're outdoors, you're working hard, you're hot, and you're sweaty, and you're dirty, and you can't wait to cool off. Finally, at the end of the day, you get a chance to take a dip in the ocean, you sit down under the shade of a coconut tree, you feel that sea breeze blow on you, and you say, That feeling of relief, John, that's what we mean when we say skin windy. And I thought, perfect way of translating the kind of peace this woman is experiencing after being sick for so long. 
And a perfect way to describe the kind of peace that we experience, we can be skin windy as well, done worrying about whether we're good enough when we learn about how God has forgiven us for everything we've done because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Now, have you ever been skin windy? I think you have. But it wasn't just the translation project that needed to be transformed, nor the lives of the translators that we work with. Sometimes the missionaries need to be transformed as well. Early in our time in Papua New Guinea, I saw in myself attitudes, behaviors, ways of thinking about difficulties that I knew needed to be transformed. Our first night in a village in Papua New Guinea, our daughter got over 300 bug bites, probably three, I have no idea. But she didn't sleep through the night for the rest of our five weeks during that village day. It was the end of a very long dry season. We hardly had enough water to drink. Our village neighbors would bring us water in a bamboo uh, stick that they got from the stream, and we would boil it and, and sometimes not even let the white silt filter out before we drank it. We were so thirsty. We were hot. We were tired. We were miserable. And I let everyone who spoke English know just how bad things were. Such a blessing to speak English. <laughs> I did realize that I probably had an attitude problem, um, but I also realized that it had been a very long time before that since I had spent time with God in His Word and allowed Him to speak to me. So I told the Lord, probably not very reverently, that I will read your Word and listen if you have something to say, if you can keep me awake long enough to hear what that is, because I usually put myself to sleep reading, and every moment that Brianna slept, I slept. But I did. Uh, on her first nap, her next nap, I opened the book of Philippians, a good attitude book, by the way, and started reading. And I don't know how many days it took before I did stay awake long enough to hear what God had to say. And what he said was this, do everything without complaining or arguing. Okay, that was the end of that reading. I understood. <laughs> I understood complaining. I figured that part out on my own. I knew I was doing plenty of that. But what was, who was I arguing with? What was that about? And God said to me, you're arguing with me that I'm not doing this right. And sure enough, I mean, I couldn't argue with a one-year-old to sleep more. I couldn't argue with our neighbors to make it rain more. I was arguing with God. And I remember hearing myself say, God, you should be doing this differently. You should make this at least doable. Make it easier so we can be here. We're here to serve you. Make this possible for us to do this. But he went on from there. And he said, do everything without complaining or arguing, so that, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. I knew and saw lots of ways that the people around us needed their worldview changed, their ideas, their behaviors changed by the word of God, but at that point in my life it wasn't doing much to change me. I pictured myself easily uh, standing in front of a community one day of Papua New Guineans and holding out that word of life, that newly translated book and newly printed book in their language and saying, you people really need this book. It doesn't work to change me, but you people really need this book. And right then I renewed my commitment to the Lord to be transformed personally by His word in my language and that same word that I hoped would one day transform the lives of the Papua New Guineans around us. When was the last time God's word in your language transformed you in those very subtle things that we often miss that are not pleasing to the Lord? That day finally came when we got to hold out the word of life to the uh, Papua New Guineans we were working with in the New Translation Project. The first book of Luke was published, the, uh, the first book of the New Testament was published, the, the Gospel of Luke. Villages that received those scriptures um, celebrated with singing, with dancing, with prayers, speeches. Luke was only 12% of the New Testament, so they prayed for, prayed for perseverance for the translators, that they would keep going and finish the job. Cicero translator Kenny Eitrum was one of the translators that they prayed for, and specifically relevant to him, because he suffers from recurring malaria. There's often times when he can't finish a workshop because he's so sick he needs to go home and recover. One day at the translation workshop, 
he told the, and during the devotion time, he told his fellow translators this, My faith is growing stronger as I see all the things that God is doing among us. No way am I ever going to stop doing this work, no matter what problems come, because everything will eventually pass away, but God's Word will last forever. How is God's Word transforming you? How is it strengthening you? And how are you using that strength to offer God's Word to others? You know, all the steps of editing and um, checking that we do as we're working on the translations can get to be tedious, and it can be all up here in our heads. And uh, we can sometimes feel like it's getting to be a bit much. But um, when we were checking the Gospel of Luke with the speakers of the um, various languages that are along the coast, that's a portion of the languages that we work in, just we were checking three of them at the same time. And we came to a passage that you quoted this morning, Pastor, um, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and, run, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And we were checking to make sure people were understanding this, but nobody was getting that me- mental picture. So I went next door to our house, got a container of granola, and I started pouring it into a, a, a cup. I poured it into the cup until it was full, and then I shook it down and poured in some more until it overflowed. And then I heard the translators all murmuring, all talking to each other. Now, our common conversation was done. Lots of little conversations are happening now. But that's good. We want to hear that when we're doing translation. And a few minutes later, the Arab said, okay, now that we understand what's going on here, we've changed our translation, and this is what it sounds like. It, they, they wrote... Y'all must give to others. Oh, I should have told them this is a southern dialect of ours. Y'all must give to others, and God will give to y'all in turn and add more. And he will pour in and pour in until it's full, then shaken down until it settles, and then he'll totally fill it up again until it spills over for whatever measure y'all use to give to others. That's the measure y'all will receive in return. What measure are you all using? This scripture has been fulfilled in the life of one of our friends, um, Leone Peter, the late life, the late wife of our good friend and fellow translator, Pastor Peter Marokiki. She has been, um, she's seated in the middle here between our, our partner Beth Fuller and uh, Peter and Leone's daughter Bonnie. You may guess who she's named after. Leone had stood by her husband Peter while he was translating the Bible into his language for more than 25 years. I say his language because it's not her native language. Her native language is Bounty Baraku. And on the night that our laser printer was printing the Gospel of Luke in her language, she was there. And our partner Beth took the pages, stapled the books together, and sat down with Leone, and Beth started to read it in Leone's language. And as Beth started to read, Leone started to giggle. And the more Beth read, the more Leone giggled until Beth said, Sister, tell me what I'm doing wrong. What, am I pronouncing it wrong or what? And Leone said, No, but this is my language. This is my language. And when a man from the Mawo language group read some scripture to his children in their language for the very first time, his daughter said, Daddy, this is so delicious. Delicious. Isn't that what God's Word is to us when it speaks directly to our hearts because we can hear it clearly in a translation that we understand? It is delicious. But how often do we say to our Heavenly Father, Daddy, this is delicious. But this little girl had more to say. She said, Daddy, this is so delicious. Can you bring us some more? That's what John and I are all about. That's what Liquid Bible Translators is all about. There are still over 2,000 languages in the world with no scriptures. As we counted down, that number was a bit less, but it's gone up again because there are more than 400 signed languages in the world. Very few of them have any scripture at all. Liquid's mission and vision is to see a Bible translation project started in every one of those languages by the year 2025. It's an audacious goal. It's a prayer request. It's what we are asking God to do 
And since we started asking God to do that in 1999, the pace of Bible translation has picked up so rapidly that some of your children or grandchildren may be alive on the day when the last language celebrates receiving the scriptures, whether they hear it tweeted or see it on Instagram, who knows how it will be made public. But it may happen in their lifetime. The RF translators have gone from that 12% in the first book, they're up to 50% now and, and going strong. They're wanting to pass that opportunity to hear God's word on to others. So each language group is committed to recruit a couple more translators to continue finishing the New Testament in their language so these experienced translators can move on to the neighboring languages. There's still more to go, just right in their area. A life transformed by the Word of God wants to share it with others. How is God's Word transforming you? And how is He leading you to share it with the people that you see and touch every day in your life? Let's listen again to God's Word, to the passage we read earlier today. What God's Word says about itself in our language. For the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, making us in windy. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. When spilling granola can reveal its true meaning. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And some of us can't stop giggling. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Causing us to persevere, even through recurring malaria. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Absolutely delicious. By them is your servant warned. When we're tempted to complain, rather than to trust God when the unexpected happens. In keeping them, there is great reward. What if everyone here today received with joy the scriptures in your own language and allowed them to transform you for the glory of God and for the furthering of his kingdom. Please pray with me. Thank you, Father, that you reveal yourself to us in your word. May we hear your voice and follow your direction when things don't go according to our plans. Please, use your word to transform our lives and make us more like your son. Thank you for letting us participate in bringing your word to those who still wait to hear it in their own language. Don't let us take for granted that we can read it in our language, read in our own language, about your forgiveness and peace through the death of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray.